The Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't have to have the Apostle John to tell us. Right? You and I both know that we do not deserve salvation. So the question is, how can God stay holy and punish sin, but still allow sinners into His presence? That's the power of the gospel. By now you all know that the LADS program is study in Romans this next year. And our first LADS day will be in September, probably the second Sunday in September. And they will start studying Romans more intensely. I think chapter 6, verses 9 through 16 or something like that is on the table in the uh, foyer and by the door out there if you're studying Romans with us. There's no substitute for doing that. You can be here and you can listen to me and you can read through Romans chapter 3 with me tonight, but there's no substitute for you spending time yourself looking at the text. And so I would encourage you to do that. If you decide you want to start tonight, I could go back and print out all the other questions for you if you want to get caught up to date, because that's just chapter 6. So we're not too far into the letter. As far as my sermons are concerned, we're in chapter 3. So the theme of Romans is chapter 1 and verse 16, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Later in chapter 1, Paul points out that Gentiles are lost, and so they need the gospel. Chapter 2, as we looked at last month, chapter 2, Paul focuses on the Jews and he said, we also are lost without the gospel. And that brings us to chapter 3. Where Paul points out, first of all, again, that the Jews need the gospel. I don't, we have no idea what the percentage is, but part of the church of Christ in Rome had a Jewish background, and part of the church of Christ in Rome had a Gentile background. So sometimes Paul directs his thoughts specifically to the Jews to help them understand your family is lost if they don't obey the gospel of Christ. So his first point that we're going to look at in verses 1 through 8, the Jews need the gospel. But then in 9 through 20, Paul is going to point out that everybody needs the gospel. To reiterate that point, nobody can be saved without the gospel. And that point needs to sink in. Because sometimes we use our human wisdom and think, well, if there's somebody in, in the Amazon forest in South Africa and they've never heard the Bible and they have no idea who Jesus of Nazareth is, well, then maybe they can be saved. No, they can't. Nobody can be saved without the gospel. There is no hope held out for anybody to stand in the presence of God this side of the cross who has not been washed by the blood of Christ. It doesn't matter where they live. And that's why it's imperative that the Lord's church take the Great Commission seriously and get the Word of God into people's hands so that they can know it because they can't obey it if they don't know it. And Paul will argue in Romans chapter 10 that they can't know it if somebody doesn't take it to them. That's why missions need to be at the the top of our list of things to do. And then in back to chapter 3, in verses 21 through 31, Paul will answer that question, how can God be just, holy, and justify sinners at the same time? We'll get to there in just a moment. Let's begin in chapter 3 and verse 1 where Paul talks about the fact that the Jews need the gospel. Now, in these first five verses, Paul will ask four significant questions as we read through here. Pay attention to these questions. What advantage has the Jew? You could imagine that those Jewish Christians in the church in Rome were asking that question. 
if people are saved without the law of Moses, which is what Paul pointed out in chapter 2, if people can be saved without the law of Moses, then what good is it to be a Jew? The second question is kind of related to that. What profit was circumcision? If people can be saved without being circumcised. Again, Paul pointed that out in chapter 2. So what good is it? His Jewish Christian audience might ask him. Question number three is, does the, the unbelief or the the rejection of God's plan in Christ from the Jews, does that nullify God's plans? Does that nullify God's promises, God's faithfulness? That's the third question. And the fourth is, since man's sin is overruled by God, since the Jews' disobedience is overruled by God to bring Jesus into the world, how can it be just for God to punish those whose sins were so used? So let's go back and take a look at what Paul, at what Paul says. Verse 1, then what advantage? Remember, let's go back up to chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where Paul says physical circumcision means nothing to God now. When God looks down from heaven, he says, who down there are children of Abraham by faith? He's not looking to see whether or not they're circumcised physically. Verse 29, he's looking to see if they're circumcised spiritually. That's what makes the difference. So chapter 3, verse 1, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. Now for him to say that, you expect him to make a big long list, wouldn't you? Well, he's only going to mention one thing here. He's going to come back to that list in chapter 9. So right now he says, great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Doesn't it help to be faithful to God if you've got the Word of God? So the Jews were given God's message, Mount Sinai, Law of Moses. In fact, in uh, verses 9 through 18, he's going to quote from Psalms and Isaiah and refer to that as the law as well. So the whole Old Testament the Jews had. They, of all people, they have, should have been faithful to God. And they should have been prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. That was, their, that was their purpose. Isaiah tells them that you were to be witnesses to the nations around you. And so God's plan was for the Jews to be faithful to God until Jesus came. And when Jesus came, they would accept Jesus as the Son of God. They would become the first Christians. And then you would have a whole mass of missionaries going out into the world. Except the Jews, by and large, didn't accept that. We all know they turned their back on God and gave themselves to idolatry. So God had to focus on the remnant. But they had the oracles of God. If some did not, verse 3, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? So even though the majority of Israel turned their back on God, does that nullify God's faithfulness? Does that change God's plans? Because the majority of the world does not obey the gospel, does that mean God's going to change His gospel? Does that mean that God is unfaithful? Look at Paul's answer. May it never be. In the Greek language, that's as emphatic and negative as it can be. If Paul were writing in bold, he would have put that sentence in bold. In Greek, it's meganoito. It's the negative side of the word amen. Okay, so amen means may it be. It comes from the Hebrew verb that means it is true. So amen means I agree that what you've said is true. This is the negative part of that. It is absolutely not true. So Paul says it is absolutely not true that the disobedience of the Jews nullified God's faithfulness. But he goes on to say in verse 4, Rather let God be true, though every man be found a liar. And then he goes on, it just says it is written that you may be justified, God may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. God's word is always going to prove itself to be true. 
It doesn't matter what man does or what man says. Apologetics Press has a book dealing with alleged contradictions in the Bible. And the title of the book is The Anvil Rings. So they picture the Word of God as an anvil. You know, you use an anvil to pound and bang metal into the shape that you want it to be in because nothing's going to break an anvil. Well, nothing's going to break the Word of God. God's Word is true. Anything that disagrees with God's Word is false. And so Paul is going to be calling the, the, the Jews back to the law that guided them to Christ in the first place. So God is justified in His words, and when God condemns the disobedience of the Jews, God is justified in that. And even if Israel critiques God and judges God, God's going to prove to be true. We have people in our society who want to, th who want to think that they can judge God. The God of the Bible is not fair. The God of the Bible is not smart. The God of the Bible is not this. He's not that. Well, you just keep on saying that. And you'll find out how hard the anvil is one day. So Paul says in verse 4, Let God be found true, but every man be a lie. There's a tract. You old Christians, older Christians, recognize this tract. Uh, something is wrong, but the Bible is right. Y'all remember that? It was, a little, it was a little booklet, actually, where it quoted from... Uh, manuals and catechisms and creeds of different denominational churches and then it had the Word of God printed out there beside it. Where you could, you could see what man says and then you could see what God says beside it. Let God be found true and every man be found a liar. Paul goes on to say in verse 5, if our unrighteousness, now he's talking about the Jews' unbelief back in verse 3. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. Do you want to see the holiness of God? Look at the unholiness of man. If you want to understand the righteousness of God, look at the unrighteousness of man. Because God is the exact opposite. Take all of the really good people that you know. All of, all of the good, outstanding Christians you know. And there's some negative in there, isn't there? Pull out all of the good qualities out of them. And God is those good qualities to the nth degree. That's the perfection of God. So, Paul says... <laughs> If our unrighteousness, our disobedience, speaking to the Jewish nation, if our disobedience demonstrates the righteousness of God, what are we going to say? Is God unrighteous when he inflicts wrath on, on, on the Jewish nation? You think about the Babylonian exile, the Assyrian exile. You think about the destruction of the temple uh, in uh, 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed yet by the Romans, but it will. It's just a couple of decades in the future. Is God unrighteous when he inflicts wrath? Not at all. Notice what Paul says, verse 6. May it never be. There's that emphatic negative again. It's used 15 times in the New Testament. Paul uses it 14 out of those 15 times. And he uses it three times just in this chapter. So Paul is, is arguing here with some of those Jewish Christians. Maybe there's some uh, non-Christian Jews who are kind of in this argument as well. And so Paul goes on to say, otherwise, how will God judge the world? If God is unrighteous when he inflicts wrath, how could he judge the world? I'm going to have a series of lessons next year on the nature of God. Maybe y'all recognize the name Gus Nichols, preacher from Alabama. I think he died back in the 70s. He said, to try to understand the nature of God is like drinking the ocean dry with a tablespoon. That's an awesome thought. We ought to take God as he reveals himself in the Bible. What kind of God do we serve? 
Paul says God was, would not be righteous to not judge the world, would he? Verse 6. Verse 7, if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As some people are slanderously saying that we say. So others don't know exactly what Paul is alluding to here. But I imagine that Paul is responding to people who is criticizing him for, for saying you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. I imagine people are saying, you're just saying that to get people to follow Christ. You're doing evil. You're telling them something that's not true in order to build up the Christian faith. So they are slanderously saying, let us do evil that good may come. Let us tell a lie in order for the glory of God to abound. Now Paul's arguing against that. He's saying, I don't, I don't do that. That is kind of parallel to what he's been saying about the Jews, that their disobedience reveals the righteousness of God. Well, he's saying, my disobedience, if that's what you want to call it, my disobedience does not reveal the glory of God. Let us do evil that good may come. He says, their condemnation is just. So he's critiquing those that are accusing him of using impure means to reach a good end. The end doesn't justify the means, to word it another way. And so in verse 9, Paul talks about the impartiality of the gospel. Everybody is lost without the gospel. Nobody can be saved unless they obey the gospel. What then? Are we, Jews, better than they, Gentiles? Not at all. Paul says we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Everybody's lost, Paul says. That's what I proved in chapter 1, and that's what I proved in chapter 2. Everybody's lost. Now, <clears throat> again, the Jews believed that they were God's gift to the world. When God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to bless the world through your seed, the Jews understood the word seed there to refer to them. We are God's gift to the world. And that's not true, of course. First of all, the seed is actually Jesus. That's Galatians 3 and verse 16. And so secondly, the blessing of the world through the seed of Abraham was referring to Jesus. And yet here, Paul is going to go back to their scriptures. He's going back to their scriptures to show them that their thinking is wrong. And so beginning in verse 10... Through verse 18, Paul has six quotations from the Old Testament. Five of them are from the book of Psalms and one of them from the book of Isaiah to show the Jews that their own book condemns them. And that's why they need a Savior. Verse 10, he quotes from Psalms 14, verses 1 through 3. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. <clears throat> if you want to get into a Bible study with somebody, you just read those verses to them and ask them, on what grounds are you going to stand before God on the day of judgment? Nobody has done good. Nobody deserves heaven. Beginning in verse 13, he quotes from Psalms 5 verse 9, Their throat is an open grave, with their tongues they keep deceiving. Psalms 140 verse 3, The poison of asps is under their lips. They, they will consume anything and everything. I think that's referring to lying, it's referring to stealing, it's referring to extortion. They can consume everything that everybody else has. They want it all. And of course, they're also deceptive. The poison of asps is under their lips. So they're dangerous with their tongue. Verse 14, he quotes from Psalms 10 and verse 7, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. 15, here's where he quotes from Isaiah. 59 verses 7 and 8, their feet are swift to shed blood. 
destruction and misery are in their paths, and in the path of peace they have not known. And then back to Psalms 36 and verse 1. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Paul is saying to these Jewish Christians, this is what your own Bible says. Nobody's right in the eyes of God. We need a Savior. And so he kind of summarizes that in verses 19 and 20. When he says, now we know that whatever the law says, notice he's just quoted from Psalms and Isaiah, and he says, here's what the law says. It is true that the Jew did not just view, the, by the time of Jesus, the Jew did not view the law as just being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They viewed the whole Old Testament as being the law of God. And to prove that a second time, and I can't give you the exact verse. In a discussion one time with somebody about mechanical instruments of music and worship, you point out the fact that the law of Moses had been nailed to the cross. That's why David could use mechanical instruments of music. Of course, God commanded him to, and why we can't. Their response was, there's mechanical in instruments of music in the book of Psalms. Psalms is not a part of the law of Moses. Therefore, it's okay to keep using them. The person who made that argument did not know what he was talking about. It wasn't hard to prove that. You know how I proved it? I looked up the word law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and found in the Gospel of John where Jesus uses the word law to refer to the book of Psalms. That doesn't take special education. It just means I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid. I'm going to go back and double check and see if what he says is true. So the Jews, the mentality of the Jews by the time of Jesus was that the law included everything in the Old Testament. And basically that's what Paul is saying here in verse 19. So we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So Paul is saying your law shows that you are lost and your mouth should be closed. Did you ever get into a back and forth with your mom or dad and they said, shut up? <laughs> Basically, that's what Paul is telling the Jews right here. You're not God's gift to humanity and you're not righteous enough to go to heaven. Verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for, the, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Family, if you take Jesus out of the picture, take Jesus out of the picture, and those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't do a squat. The only way those animal sacrifices could provide atonement, and in fact they did provide atonement, let me back up and say that when the, when the Jews offered those animal sacrifices, they were forgiven of their sins right then and there but only because God knew Jesus was coming into the world. That's the only reason why those animal sacrifices had, had any power, because Jesus was coming. These Jews that Paul is trying to argue with here, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're trying to take Jesus out of the picture. And so that's why Paul is arguing there is no justification under the law. You can't be right with God by offering animal sacrifices. That just won't work. So here's the question. How can you be right in the eyes of God? And God stay holy? That's verses 21 through 31. Verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The whole point is, man is saved by faith, when he does what God tells him to do. Jesus comes from God to show us how to be right with God. So the law and the prophets, Habakkuk 2 and verse 20, the righteous shall live by his faith. Paul will quote that verse in, in Galatians. 
So the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's been witnessed by the law and the prophets. They've pointed to the coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God. Now notice how many times he refers to the righteousness of God in this text. Verse 21, verse 22, verse 25, and verse 26. How can God be right and still justify sinners? Verse 23, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, was saved the same way that the Jews were saved on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It wasn't through the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was by believing and obeying the gospel of Christ. Now, there is no distinction. People are saved right here in Schwartz Creek, Michigan in the same way that they're saved in Romania or Russia or North Korea or wherever else it might be. There's no distinction with God. Notice he says in verse 23. Now, of course, verse 23 is one of those verses that we all should have memorized. Notice the tenses of the verbs. For all have sinned, past tense, and fall, present tense short of the glory of God. Nobody can be justified outside of Jesus Christ because we have sinned against God and we continue to fall short of the glory of God. I read one time that I think it was a police officer or maybe a lawyer who estimated how many times that the average driver violates a traffic law within a city block. It's like a 10 or 12 times. When you make a left-hand turn, do you turn immediately into the left lane or do you turn into the right lane? You're supposed to turn into the left lane. People violate that all the time. When it comes to the law of God, family, you and I probably violate the law of God on a regular basis. We fall short of the glory of God. You think about how Jesus responded to the people, and we don't respond the same way. And when I mean me, we, I mean me too. We fall short of the glory of God. And so we need a Savior. And so all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice verse 24, we are justified. Justification comes as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Do you get the idea that Jesus is at the center of God's plans? <laughs> Do you get the idea that Jesus is at the center of being right with God? Those who are in Christ Jesus. Now when Paul says in Christ Jesus, he means those who are in the church. Now, it's not the church that saves, it's Christ that saves, but when Christ saves, He puts us into His church. And so justification is a gift by His grace. But that does not exclude obedience. Remember, all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says that God set me apart as an apostle of Christ to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. And he's going to put baptism at the center of obeying the gospel in chapter 6. But when we talk about salvation being a gift, it means we can't earn it. Just because I repent, just because I'm baptized, doesn't mean I still deserve salvation. It's all because I'm doing what God told me to do, and that's it. And so Paul says justification is a gift by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith which was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. Take out your pen. You need to write this down in the margin of your Bible. That word propitiation and at the beginning part of verse 25 is the Greek word for mercy seat. When the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek, which is the Septuagint, this word right here, hilestrion in Greek, is the word the translators use for mercy seat. The place where the sacrifice was made on the day of atonement for the sins of the priest and for the sins of all of Israel. 
at the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the meeting place between the holy God and holy man. Jesus is that meeting place today. He is the place, the location, where we are made right in the eyes of God. So Paul says God displayed Christ publicly as our mercy seat in His blood through faith for God to demonstrate His righteousness because God was patient. We see the forbearance of God throughout the Old Testament so that He passed over those sins previously committed. So God allowed those animal sacrifices to atone for the sins of Israel because God knew Jesus was coming. Otherwise, the blood of bulls and goats do not take away sin. Hebrews 10 and verse 4. So God passed over the sins previously committed in order to bring Jesus into the world. Verse 26. For the demonstration, Paul says, of His righteousness at the present time, so that... He could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So how is it that God could be holy and be just and punish sin and still allow sinners into His presence by making a way for us to be forgiven through His Son? Jesus is that sacrifice. Jesus felt the wrath of God. Jesus drank from the cup of the wrath of God. Remember we studied about the cup of the wrath of God from Revelation chapter 14. Jesus said, I'm going to drink the cup of the suffering. He's referring to the cup of God's wrath. He drank that for us. We've just got to be connected to Christ. And he'll talk about that in chapter 6. That's how God is just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. So, verse 27. Where then is boasting? Where are you going to brag? On what grounds are you going to brag? On what basis are you going to tell, look God in the eyes and tell Him, I deserve heaven? How many good works are you going to do in order to look God in the eye and say, I deserve heaven? You can't. It's excluded. By what kind of law? The law of works? No, because that's not where, how salvation is found. By the law of faith. The law of the gospel. Trusting and obeying Jesus Christ. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Circumcision was the big question in that day and time. No, we're not justified by circumcision. We're not justified by the law. We're made right. And the word justification means to be made right. It carries the idea of being acquitted. Recognizing, yes, that you're guilty, but I'm going to treat you as if you're not. That righteousness, that justification, that acquittal is found through Christ. Not from works of the law, but through faith. Verse 29. Or is God the God of Jews only? Does He only save the Jews who obey the law of Moses? No. Is He not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes. Of Gentiles only. Also. That's why the law of Moses had to be nailed to the cross, because Gentiles couldn't be saved under the law of Moses. So they needed the law of Christ. They needed Christ to come so that they could be saved. Verse 30, Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith with the uncircumcised through faith is one. It's all by faith. We trust God. We trust Jesus. Because He raised Jairus' daughter from the, from the grave, because He raised the widow of Nain's son from the grave, because He raised Lazarus from the grave, and because He raised Himself from the grave. That's why we trust Him. And if we trust Him, we'll obey Him. 
verse 31. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Paul says, if we are saved by faith and not by the law of Moses, does that nullify the law? Not at all. He says, we in fact establish the law. Notice he says, may it never be, verse 31. On the contrary, we establish the law. The law was the tutor to bring us to Christ. Once we come to Christ and we have faith in Jesus Christ and we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, that proves the law was true. Jesus is the purpose of the law. He'll say that in Romans chapter 10. Jesus is the goal of the law. And so to say that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ really just brings the law to its perfect conclusion. It is fulfilled in the coming of Christ. That's what Jesus meant when John the Baptist said, uh, I, I have need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me to be baptized. And Jesus says, allow it to be so for we must fulfill all righteousness. What Jesus means is the law of Moses was trying to provide righteousness, but it couldn't on its own. Jesus Christ is the one who comes to fulfill that call for righteousness. Jesus fulfilled the righteous plan of God beginning at the point when he was baptized. So, yes, we are justified through Jesus Christ because he drank the cup of God's wrath in our place. And because we can be saved by his death and we can be justified by his life, and that's how we can be right with God. That's the power of the gospel. And that's the message everybody needs to hear. If we can help you tonight in your effort to obey the gospel, let us know what we can do while we stand and sing.